New Orleans Saints and the Atlanta Falcons here. The Falcons squeak out a win, 26-24. Uh, Anytime these divisional teams face off, uh, you know it's going to be tight. They know each other so, so well. But let's uh, talk about Atlanta's top five graded players since they won, so they get the honors here at the top. Defensive tackle David Onyemata at the very top of this list with an 88.4. Love to see that number. Normally, we have a, a snap cutoff here where we say, okay, it's got to be a minimum of at least 25 snaps. Tyler Algier, I think he played like 22 or 23 snaps. I didn't care. I was putting the names in for this one. I wasn't keeping him off the list. That's my guy. He played very well yesterday. Uh, out snapped B. John Robinson in a lot of ways. So he had an 86.4 PFF grade yesterday. I think how efficient he was was a big reason why they were able to play as well as they were to get the victory. Linebacker Troy Anderson with the 82.6. Number, uh, at number four, cornerback Mike Hughes in 80.1. And then number five, the other running back, B. John Robinson with a 75.5. Kirk Cousins with a 70.00 overall great in this one. Flipping over to New Orleans side of things, their wide receiver Chris Olave at the top of the list. Their highest graded player with an 86.2. Edge rusher Carl Granderson with an 81.2 right after that. Cornerback Marshawn Lattimore back from injury. 79.6 in this one, running back Alvin Kamara with a 78.6, and then edge rusher Chase Young, 71.7. Derek Carr, an 85.0, would have been in this list. But uh, like we said, we separate the quarterbacks to make sure that we can uh, that we can highlight them no matter what. What was the stat that told the story? Am so, I going here first on this one? Or can, no, are you no I, I can go first okay, here. That's right, fine. The first right. one just seemed too obvious. Okay. But uh, no, so it's funny, that, sure. it's funny that Derek Carr with an 85 grade there, he did have a very good game, and, and he really adjusted better to coverages, I think, than last week. But I, I still think if you're trying to keep yourself in a game against the Saints, like the Falcons did here or like the Eagles did last week, you take away the deep ball and you take away or, or you just hope the Saints don't call a whole lot of play action. And they've kind of gotten away from those two things uh, in, in the last two weeks. Look, first two weeks of the season, Carr hit three deep balls for 168 yards and two touchdowns. He was 14 to 20 on play action. Yesterday, only threw two deep balls. Falcons were sitting back, making him throw it in front of them. And he was 0 for 2 on those two deep balls. And only five play action passes all day. And he went three for five on those. The two, the impact of those two things is why the Saints look a lot different on offense right now. And yes, you make Derek Carr work for it. And yesterday he did play well. I mean, he gave him the lead with, what, a minute to go? It's not that he didn't play well, but it's a lot less explosive right now for the Saints on offense. Those were the two things that were their hallmark in the first two weeks. And now in the last two weeks, they've kind of been taken away. Over the last two weeks, two for seven on deep balls with 56 yards and an interception, right? So they're, you're not letting Rashid Shahid get over the top. You're not right. letting Chris Olave get over the top. Now, Olave had a fantastic game yesterday, yeah. and he's great in the intermediate game, but Teams are now making they, – they've adjusted. They've, they're making the Saints work for it. And they ran the ball pretty well. They got back to running the ball a little bit better than they did last week. Um, Atlanta didn't go with the big five- and six-man fronts that um, Philadelphia did last week. But it, it's the part where it's like, okay, if you keep the Saints in front of you like Atlanta did here or like Philly did last week – you're at least in it. You're at least in the game. It's going to be a closer to the vest game, and you're making the Saints and you're making Derek Carr kind of throw in this bubble, right? It's the same thing we keep talking about with these deeper shell coverages where it's like, okay, make these quarterbacks beat you 8, 10, 12 yards at a time. Did Carr do it yesterday? Yeah, they, they didn't lose this game because of Derek Carr. Absolutely not. Not even the, the pick six obviously was on him with the tip ball and funny bounce that got to Troy Anderson and all of that. But right. this is this is how, if you're going to beat the Saints, this is how you beat them. You just have to keep them in front of you. So Carr did have a nice day, but the explosiveness is not there in their passing game right now. Yeah, look, I, I do agree with you. Everything you kind of you said with, with Derek Carr, needing that part of their offense to really rev up, and, and it was missing from this part of their game. The stat that told the story for me, it was the Rashid Shahid fumble, where and, and that's the, the muffed punt fumble where, you know, it bounces off of his chest and his hand, and it goes into the end zone, and normally you can't advance, advance a fumble, but it goes into the end zone, and um, Hodge jumps on it, and Atlanta gets a touchdown there. This game was a two-point game, and when I was sort of going through the statistics that we have here and the data points, I was like, okay, there are, I guess, a couple of different things that I could point out, but it is funny how close this game was, and it seems like a coaching cliche to be like, yep, ah, yep, turnover. Yeah, you lost a turnover. It was a big turnover. That turnover, in my opinion, made the entire difference in the ball game because when you look at the Atlanta Falcons, who won this game, they were worse on third down. They were worse in the red zone. They had more penalties. They had less time of possession, and they had less total yards. What did the Falcons do better than the Saints in this game? 
basically just jumped on a phone. And, and I'm not trying to say that to take anything away from the Falcons. And, and the pick six they had was all, you know, by admission, incredibly lucky. But, it really was. But th- this was one of those games where you sort of look back on it. And again, I don't say this to take anything away from the Falcons in this game, but you look at it and you go, hey, Sometimes better be lucky than good, if you will. And in this game, we were a little bit more lucky than the division opponent. And when you play these teams really tight, these two rosters who know each other very, very well. I know coaching staffs are a little new, so I didn't want to say that. But rosters and players and tendencies and things like that, certainly a lot of the Saints have been around in the same building for a long time with that coaching staff. Sometimes it really just is that. The ball's got to bounce your way one or two times, and it did for the Falcons, and that's why they won this game. So um, I wish I had more of a, you know, enlightening stat, but when I looked throughout all of, like, the major categories, I was like, all right, where do I start here? Penalties, time of possession, you know, key moments, third down, red zone, total yards, what was it? The Falcons were worse than the Saints in every single one of those categories. Yeah. And yet, they won the football game. So uh, my most impressive in this one, you know, speaking of how well I feel like New Orleans played, Chris Olave is a superstar, man. He is a superstar wide receiver. When they need a big catch, they go to Chris Olave. And I feel like the defense knows the ball is going to Chris Olave, and it does not matter. He caught 8 of 10 targets in this game for 87 yards. It's not like, you know, he broke a career high in receiving yards or anything like that. But 3 out of 3 when it came to targets and catches on third down, all 3 going for first downs, especially as the game was kind of coming into its closing most important and impactful moments, they went to Chris Olave. And I just, as I watched that game, especially down the stretch, that was such a big takeaway of who was really impressive for me. There were a lot of impressive performances, but I think long term, this is the guy that's worth shouting out. Not that we don't talk about Chris Olave before, but he is that good. I don't think Chris Olave gets talked about enough with some of those very top tier receivers. And to be honest with you, what he can be in this Saints Clint Kubiak offense is up there with some of those top guys. You know, I, I don't know if he's ever going to have the stat volume, but the impact of a Justin Jefferson or a Jamar Chase or a Devontae Adams or something like that. They lean on Chris Olave like he is one of these players. And he's come up in so many big moments. I thought yesterday was a lot more of them. Absolutely. He is no less than a, at the very worst, a top 15 receiver. Absolutely. For sure. Probably 12, possibly 10. I mean, he, he's that good. I mean, he can do it at all levels of the field. And for this team, he does it really at that intermediate level. For for the answer that they needed over the last two weeks against these these softer shell coverage, and, and things like that when, when Rashid Shahid was the star of the first two games. Now you answer that, you take away the deep ball, you get Olave working everywhere underneath in that 20-yard box, and he's uncoverable in that range. In that intermediate range, if Derek Carr has time, good luck covering Chris Olave for three, three and a half seconds, absolutely. Uh, you mentioned it. There wasn't a whole lot. Olave was great. Carr was good. There wasn't a whole lot to be impressed by in this game. So let me just shout out the third phase with my most impressive. I'll go with Young Way Koo. Nice. Falcons kicker. Love it. The Falcons did not score an offensive touchdown in this game. Kicked four field goals. Koo hit all of them. All of them from 40 and beyond. The game winner from 58. I mean, just such an impressive kick. I believe a career long for him uh, from 58. I think it was, yeah. Currently the second highest graded kicker in the league behind Brandon Aubrey. And as an added bonus, took over the kickoff duty from Bradley Pinion this week. Young Way Koo, look, he, he's the reason they won the game at he the is. end of it, right? I yeah. mean, he's got, got 12 points, scored 12 more points than, than really than their offense did when you think about it. So, I, I mean, just, yeah, it, it's kind of indicative of how this game went that, that I had to pick Atlanta's kicker as my most impressive play. I, I picked Dallas's kicker last week yeah. so you know we're just the, it's a kicker league you know as I've often said uh, who's your most disappointing before we move on uh, and he had some uh, a guy for the Saints who had some good moments but then had some some really bad ones too he had Paulson Adebo out there at corner okay. Look, he had an he had an interception got got a made a really nice play in interception fourth three in completions but also gave up seven catches for 120 yards and most importantly a, a pretty obvious defensive pass interference call that set up that um, that 58 yard field goal and got the Falcons into field goal range so uh, tough day, tough day for him. It was a competitive day. He did have some good moments, but at the end of it, made the big error at the end that, that gave the Falcons the winning field goal. Uh, my most disappointing uh, hurts my Florida Gator heart, but it, Kyle Pitts. I mean, we're now looking at, okay, how many years, how many regimes, how many different game scripts do we need to just tell us he, I don't know if he's just ever going to be the guy in Atlanta. It really feels like there's too much evidence to the contrary for that. Three targets, zero catches in this game, 
And now he is at a career low of a 14.9% threat percentage, which if you watched the show before, you know that's how often you are being targeted for the routes that you are running. He's just not a major part of this offense. And I think a lot of people would look at this and say, all right, all right, you know, maybe you run the passing offense through Drake London. You know, even people who like Darnell Mooney out there, what Kyle Pitts was supposed to be, what he was drafted to be, he should have at least been wide receiver two on this team or target option number two. And he's just not. And and now we've we're, we're getting too many years, too many games under our belt where he is going down in volume. He's going down in target share, and and that's just disappointing for somebody who is one of the most talented tight ends that uh, that I've seen in college football.